All right, everyone, welcome to another iFastU Q&A. Here we have Bill Hartman leading everyone off and uh, our special guest, Dr. Dr. Brian Chung, Dr. 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 I don't know, Dr. Brian Chung and our tried and true Stephen Laflamme. Stephen, what have you been working on this last month that you could maybe use some advice on? Um, I, I know the the pec major is always talked about as like a accessory muscle of inhalation, mm -hmm. but it I, it seems like based on position it could actually be uh, accessory muscle of exhalation. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, because its attachment on the humerus is below the axis of rotation of the uh, SC joint, and I guess a. I'm seeing those people where like their front hands look like they're like in their pockets like this all yes, the time. Sir. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> and I guess trying to figure out if I would change. So in like the right VC pattern, the, the left pec is overstretched from hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. But what if they don't have internal rotation and they still have a, have a limitation in horizontal abduction? Like I'm trying to figure out what's happening there. So, so what you could have is that that um, left pec major is actually the limiter to the the thorax expansion on that side, right? So uh, it's active, and so if it's active, it it'll limit any motion of the humerus that that pec should limit. So you'll see horizontal abduction limitations, you might see external rotation limitations, you might see internal rotation limitations as well, because you just don't have expansion of the thorax on that side. Does that make sense? Um, I, I think so. I'm just trying to figure out like what mechanism, you know, what, what purpose does it serve and to, you know, push their hands around so that it looks like their hands are in their front pockets all the time, like, so, so let's, let's just talk about the shape of the thorax for a second. What position is the sternum in? I mean, I guess, wouldn't that be, you'd have to know the internal rotation measures to kind of estimate that position. So, so if I don't have internal rotation, what do you think the position of the sternum is? It'd be down. Yeah. Yeah, so I can have I can have a compensatory strategy to exhale against an inhaled position, and that's going to drive the sternum down into the down pump handle position, right? Or I could I could tilt the entire thorax forward, right? So again, there's, it, it it all depends on what you're you're seeing. You can't we can't rely on a single measure to do that, but um, so if I have limited external and internal rotation on the same side then chances are I don't have posterior expansion and I don't have anterior expansion either, right? And so I'll have, I'll have a pump handle that is in a, in a compensatorily down position, and then I'll have um, a limited expansion posterior in the dorsal rostral area as well, so I'll have limitations in ER and IR. Would you go after one before the other? Yep. Which one would you go after first? Um, it it depends on um, how well they control the internal forces that are are caused by the internal organ. Right. So, do I need to put them on their back to? to manage the position of the pelvis. Well, if I have to put them on their back, then it makes sense for me to go for an anterior strategy first. If I can get them up on all fours, then I can actually go for a posterior strategy first. Okay? So again, you can't just say, oh, it's, 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 one, or, it's one or the other always. Because again, the, the whole premise behind this, this, these relationships is we've got internal forces we need to manage, and we have to manage the, the entire body against the external forces that, that we experience because of gravity. So, so again, I have to control the internal ones first. So what position does that for me? Okay. okay. 
So like if they had a descended pelvic diaphragm and limited internal rotation, like putting them on their back uh, pushes the guts up into the thoracic cavity. So it helps the pelvic floor ascend. Right. And so, okay. And so, so someone in, in, in that situation, right. I've got, I've, so I've got a narrowed, uh, pelvic volume, right? So it's, it's, it's conical for lack of a better way to explain it. So it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom, right? So I can only descend the pelvic diaphragm so far. And so what's going to happen is the, the guts fill that space up and then they start to spill over the front of the pelvis, right? And so how do you get the guts back over the center of the of the of the pelvis i tilt the pelvis back so now can i do that in standing and be effective okay there are certain positions where i can do that but again it's it's a much more complicated strategy because now i'm dealing with with gravity and position if i flop them back on their back i take a lot of gravity out of it right so now i can bring the guts back over the pelvis and as you said as the guts spread out from from laying on your back it actually moves the diaphragm into a position of exhalation so there's tremendous advantages to being on your back but there's also limitations because now i can't expand the posterior side so then that's going to determine what the best case scenario strategy is so would i go after one or the other absolutely do i know which one right off the bat no i don't have enough information until you tell me what those answers are so what, sense? yeah what uh, i'm trying to think you know uh, along those same premise premises like why i would pick all fours then versus laying on their back so that's somebody that has a little bit a little bit more more control over the position so now there's an advantage of me putting the guts on the back of the abdominals that provides it an eccentric load for me to to exhale concentrically against. Mm -hmm. So if I, need to, if I need to take an eccentrically oriented strategy in the, in the abdominals, and I need to create a concentrically oriented strategy, now I have something to push against. Now, not everybody's gonna be able to handle that. And especially if you think about, well, if I'm supporting myself through upper extremities, there's a lot of people that don't have the capacity to do that. So a lot of people with narrow infrastructural angles that are, that are reliant on a, on a, a connective tissue stability strategy and not so much a, a, a concentrically oriented muscular strategy, they can't hold that position. Right. So I can't use that right away on, on everybody just because we say, okay, narrows are, are dogs. Let's put them in all fours. We can't really say that. Right. Cause sometimes you just got to flip them over in their back because they just don't have the, the physical capacity to hold position and then be effective with, with pressure management in that position. So you're saying they don't, like they can't demonstrate the appropriate concentric abdominal activity in all fours or, or just simple upper extremity control. Right. And so I got to, I have to hold my body weight up against gravity in all fours. And if I don't have the, the concentric capabilities throughout the shoulder girdle to even achieve the, the, the position, then I got to take them out of it because what you're going to see instead of a, this, this nice, stable shoulder girdle is you're going to have those people that, that are using scapular elevation to stabilize. And they're the ones you're saying, Hey, uh, let's put your shoulders in the unshrugged position for that activity. And then as, as soon as they try to take a breath, they immediately go right back to the scapular elevation. So then it's just a bad choice because they just don't have the capacity for that position. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and my goal is to always put them in the most difficult position possible that they are successfully able to execute right and so sometimes you go to all fours and you, and you just look at it and you go oh this is not going to go well and then you immediately just have to reduce the demand so you take gravity out of the equation you take advantage of the gut position to to allow you to to uh influence the diaphragm position and then i mean all diaphragms actually um you know, when you, when you flip them over in their back, because there are, there's advantages to laying on your side, there's advantages to laying on your back, there's advantages to being in all fours and you just have to discern, you know, what your patient is actually capable of. Okay. When they're laying on, so like I, if they're laying on their left side, I know the guts are going to ascend the left thoracic yep. diaphragm. Yep. Is it going to ascend the pelvic diaphragm on that side or does, does that depend on what muscles you're recruiting? In that position. Okay. Okay. So, so now you're going to have to de de decide. Okay, what position of the of the alien do I have? Right. 
So if I manipulate the ilium, I'm manipulating inlets and outlets relative to the sacrum, correct? Yeah. So I just have to make sure that, that I am achieving the position that I desire under those circumstances, right? So do I want a counter nutated sacrum or do I want a nutated sacrum relative to the ilium? Are you using gravity and guts to try to manipulate ilium position a little bit easier? Always. Right, because that I, again, my guts are providing the internal forces of, against which I have to manage position. Right, I can definitely take advantage of them, but they're still an influence. Right, they're still gonna, they're still creating forces inside that I need to manage. So, in, in left sideline, would it be promoting? Um, would it be? What alien position would it be pr promoting on the left side and left side line? Is is that a? Can you say that? What what is what is my so what is my position in three dimensions, right? That's going to determine what the alien does, right? So you have control over that by your coaching, and so you'll you'll be able to determine that, right? So if you just lay somebody evenly on their left side, and and you look at the the internal forces that are being created. Um, that's going to put you in a very, very specific pelvic position. So you're going to have a sacrum that wants to rotate left, which would be a left counter rotation, counter mutation on that side, which means you have a relative forward ilium. And so that's retroverts the hip socket. Now that's probably not what you want. So under those circumstances, now you're going to have to create a pelvic position that achieves the, the orientation that you're, that you're seeking. Right. And that's very, very simple to do. So, so you're saying when they're in left side line, that's going to be without any muscle activity whatsoever. That's going to be what retroverts the the hip acetabulum, unless you can act, control, use muscles to combat that position. Bingo. So that's why it'd be easier to start someone in right side line if you're going after opening up the left posterior outlet because well, that, the guy pushing. Yeah. That makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It makes it a lot easier. And again, you're just playing with you're just playing with spaces and pressures, right? And so, so if if I have a if I have a, a left posterior uh, area of the pelvis that that is limited in its uh, its capacity to expand, right? I have to create a scenario that allows it to expand, right? So. Do I, I, need a, um, I need to lower the, the pressure, which means I need to eccentrically orient the musculature that controls that area of the pelvis, right? Because mm -hmm. eccentric, eccentric orientation is a low pressure strategy, right? It allows that area to expand. If I expand it, if I increase volume, pressure goes down, right? Yeah. And that's what allows me to access that position. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, that I haven't been able to kind of reason my way through the sideline position with the pelvis. Yeah. That helped a lot. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And, and did you say you use um, typically um, femoral abduction to help determine pelvis position? In regards or infrapubic angle, say, say it again. I'm sorry. Do you typically use uh, femoral abduction to help determine infrapubic angle, or are there it, any other? It can help. It does. It it's it's not always going to be the the answer because you have compensatory strategies um, superior to the pelvis that can orient the pelvis in such a way that other muscles will, will uh, concentrically orient and limit abduction, right? So it would appear that, that you've got an increased amount of activity or a decreased amount of activity. So uh, again, you, just, you, have, you have to take that into consideration. So it, it's not an absolute, right? But it can, it can certainly reinforce your, your uh, assumption and intent. 
I, I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at. Is it like, is there a battery of tests where that, you know, like they're limited in internal in hip internal rotation and they can abduct and, you know, maybe it's not a bony end feel to adduction drop and, you know, just trying to build a case through multiple tests. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess yeah. like what test do you use? Yeah, my use the same test you do. It's just a matter of piecing them together and then looking at the orientation and then making enough mistakes where you go, oh, there's another influence here. Well, what could that possibly be? You know, if you, if you have a scenario where you're where you're looking at hip rotation and you get somebody that has 50 degrees of internal rotation, start looking way way superior. Oh, yeah. okay. Because the only, way, the only way that you're going to get that much internal rotation out of a hip under most cases, in most cases, and there's always exceptions to the rules, but in most cases, is you're going to have a tremendous amount of, uh, of muscle activity on the posterior side of the thorax. So, that, that orients the pelvis so far into this, this forward rotation that the hip is resting in a loose pack position. And so you're going to pick up a ton of IR. And you'll have this, this person that has this crazy IR and this crazy ER at the same time. You're going to go, what's going on? And you'll say, oh, they're lax. No, not necessarily. It's just the orientation and, and moving the hip into a loose pack position. Sweet. Are you, are you following? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I know I've asked you the same questions like four times, but <laughs> um, you have no idea how many times I ask myself the same questions. Okay. So it's totally cool. Totally cool. And, and again, I'm willing to be wrong on some of this stuff too. It's just that, you know, again, make enough mistakes, um, you know, and make enough misjudgments and then problem solve. It's like, okay, look at your other measures. So it's like the, the hip, hip measures themselves are influenced you know, by the position of the thorax. That's why motion palpation tests uh, tend to to promote um, an opposing orientation to what your uh, appendicular measures provide you, right? So you might say that, oh, this is a unilateral extension pattern, and and you'll say that the the left ilium is anteriorly rotated, right? And then somebody will lay somebody on their back and they'll do motion palpation tests and they'll say, no, 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 the right ilium is rotated based on my tests. And then, but they, what they're not taking into consideration is like the position of the thorax has everything to do with what happens to the pelvis. So you, when, you, when you say mo motion palpation, what do you? I'm just the old school, you know, feel the ASISs and say, oh, this rotated this way, or I've got the in flare out flare concepts kind of going. So, so you know, that's why that's why those are those so so unreliable, um, okay. even within the same practitioner I mean because because as the minute I change the shape of the thorax I have reoriented the pelvis yeah thank you thank you you're welcome you're welcome how come Allison Tanner is not visible what's wrong with her hmm yeah hi Tim Allison's at work Ah. Steven, I would love if you have more detail that you want to go into, that might be super cool. Because I feel like we usually kind of gloss over it. And if anything's unclear, like we have a little bit more time this time. Um, I don't know. That I know I had to look up what the loose pack position of the hip was, and I still don't know. Um, I, have, I have questions about elbows. It's just another hip. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple. I don't know why it's so complex. Say what? Nobody knows. I know. I know. Uh, like what? What tests you use to guide decision making in regards to selecting exercises and yep. positions? Okay. So, so first things first. Um, with, with with regular consistency, can you identify the relative positions of the of the shoulder girdle? What do you say mean? Yeah, say yes. You 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 know how to identify the relative position of the shoulder girdle. You know when you have like a, a internally oriented scapula, an internally oriented humerus, or compensatory external rotation of the humerus relative to the scapula. You know how to do those, right? Well, can we talk a little bit about determining orientation versus 
compensatory position of the humerus. Sure. Um, what, like what measures would dictate, would let you know, um, you know, like a lax anterior glenohumeral ligament. Because um, I feel like it would, that's something that I do have a tough time with is, I, I feel like it all gets mixed up because you're trying to use these appendicular measures to determine axial mm -hmm. position, but then if joint struck, you know, joint structures are loose, then that, that's what I get lost in. Okay. Okay. So let's, <clears throat> so let's, let's just create a process. Okay. What is your assumption when somebody walks in the door? as to what you should see before you do any measurement whatsoever. What is your assumption in regards to the orientation of the axial skeleton on every person that walks through your door? I'm not. You better have one, right? I'd say it depends on how they walk in. No, 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 no. What is your assumption? So this is a bipedal human. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to make an assumption that they've been walking most of their life, right? So what you need first and foremost is a model in your head of what an axial skeleton should look like under most circumstances, right? So we have to have a standard of comparison. Okay. Okay. And then every test that you do is either a confirmation that this is a normal bipedal human or there is some sort of compensatory strategy or some compensatory adaptation that's on top of it. Okay. And so that's first and foremost. So you should know, all right? And the way that we know that we have a model that is useful is we know what the internal forces are and we know how the external a symmetrical component of the human is going to respond um, to those internal forces, right? So there's going to be a certain amount of, of compensatory muscle strategy that keeps me bipedal against forces that want to knock me off my feet, right? Yes. And so we, know what, so we know what those are, right? Right? And so those would be the first layer of compensation against what we would expect to be this, this imaginary symmetrical human. Am I correct? You follow. So, so it, I guess like knowing what kind of range of motion measures you would expect to see that would indicate, you know, right. that they can expand anteriorly and, anteriorly and posteriorly in their thorax, like mm -hmm. knowing what norms you expect to see so that, mm -hmm when you go through the test and it's not normal, you can start to right. make some decisions. Right. So, so now I can determine like, okay, is this what I, what I would have expected under, under most normal circumstances, or am I looking at a compensatory strategy? Right. So it's either, it's either a compensatory strategy or compensatory adaptation. Right. And so if I understand what my measures are actually measuring, in regards to, to the appendicular measures, right? So when we're measuring, you know, hip rotation, are we really just measuring hip rotation or are we looking at the relationship of the extremity to the axial skeleton, right? And that's why we have to take all of those measures because we can't, we can't look at one singular measure and say, oh, it's doing this because that, that's not enough information because we don't know how much variability there is in the axial skeleton yet. So we take all of those appendicular measures and that tells us what shape the axial skeleton is in, mm -hmm. right? And then from there, we should say, well, under this circumstance, if the axial skeleton is this shape, the scapula should be resting in this position, which should produce this type of motion or this limitation. Do I see that motion or that limitation? Yes or no? If it's yes, then they're following a normal normal positional um, situation where the, the range of motion should be as expected. So I should see limitations based on the position of the, of the sockets, right? So the, the glenoid and the, and the acetabulum, I should see a normal, normal pattern 
of what I would expect under those circumstances based on the shape of the axial skeleton. So if I have a skeleton that is twisted to the right or twisted to the left, that should change the position of the scapula, correct? Yeah. And it should, it should, it should be predictable. Relatively speaking, it should be predictable. Right. And that tells me what shape the axial skeleton is in. If it follows the norms, it's normal. If it if it goes against the norms, it's compensation. I guess what I have a tough time with is so say the thorax is, you know, twisting to the left. And, mm -hmm. and you would expect to see limitations in right shoulder internal rotation. Mm -hmm. But I can see that. I can see that. How, if they don't, how do you know, because we're using shoulder internal rotation to tell us the shape of the thorax, mm -hmm. but we're also using it to tell us if there's a compensation at the glenohumeral joint itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, so how, how do you determine, how do you delineate one from the other? So what does your left, what does your other side say? So I, I can't look at one side and, and, and say, oh, it's this. Yeah. I, need, I, need to have, I need to get a picture of the entire axial skeleton, right? And again, there's certain things that I expect to see and there's certain things that, that surprise you. And it's the surprises that let you know that you're dealing with compensation, right? So if, if let's, what, did you say rotated left? So where am I rotated left? Just so I understand because there's. I guess I, ex, just the typical right BC pattern of limited anterior chest wall expansion. So you have an upper thorax rotated to the left. Yeah. Okay. So where would you expect the scapula to be? I would expect it to be protract in a state of protraction on the right and retraction on the left. So internally rotated on the right and externally rotated on the left. Okay, let's just keep this in the yeah. like a transverse plane kind of a thing, right? Yeah. Okay, so if the humerus followed the scapula, what would you expect the, the upper extremity range of motion to be? You'd expect limited IR on the right and limited ER on the left. Not necessarily, actually. Okay. If I have an internally oriented glenoid and the humerus follows, I may not see that, right? If I compensate out of it into external rotation against an internally rotated scapula, now I can very well see normal ER or hyper ER and limited IR. So say that one more time. So, if, so if, if I have an internally oriented scapula, okay? So if, if the humerus doesn't compensate, right, into external rotation to maintain a neutral hand position, mm -hmm. okay, so if it follows, so now I'm, I, look like, I look like I'm walking with my thumb pointing at my thigh. Mm -hmm. I might have normal internal rotation under those circumstances. It's possible. It doesn't always happen, but it's possible. Okay. If I compensate against that, so if I externally rotate the humerus, mm -hmm. right, that means I'm going to concentrically orient the, the, the muscle activity on the posterior side of the shoulder. So there's going to be a really good internal rotation limitation. Right. And if I, if I, if I compensate into ER, now I'm going to create laxity in the connective tissues of the anterior shoulder. So now I'm gonna have either normal or hyper ER. So now I have a compensatory strategy. Or in a compensatory adaptation. I guess my, my probably misconception was that it was just from the limitation in IR when you're measuring it in supine was just from the scapula being resting in protraction and so you're testing in a little bit of horizontal abduction, which would push the humeral head forward towards the, um, mm -hmm. the uh, acromioclavicular, uh, not AC, um, the front of the shoulder and, and create mm -hmm. bony um, mm. What if it doesn't? 
What if you get enough upward rotation that doesn't happen? There are not one, there are many. Yeah. Okay. Because st stuff like that shows up. Yeah. I mean, you, you get surprised all the time. You go, what is that? I didn't expect that. Okay. Document it. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. It, it certainly happens. Right. But there are situations where that doesn't happen. Yeah. So how are you, how are you determining orientation versus compensation? Like you said, hyper ER of, you know, I know sometimes you'll lay people on the table and they have like 120 degrees of ER yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it's different than kind of, you know, the 90, 70, you know, 90 degrees of ER you'd expect mm -hmm. you're starting to look at compensation. Well, I mean, if you're going to get that much external rotation, you're, you're going to have some sort of compensatory strategy and most likely an adaptation that's going to occur. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's, that's, and it, while our norms are varied, right. I mean, you can get 17 different variations of normal range of motion measures, depending on what your source is, but 120 degrees of external rotation is going to be excessive in, in relative to uh, the, the average, right? Yeah. Unless you're looking at, you know, a high level baseball pitcher or, you know, anybody that's decent that can throw or a tennis player or a golfer or somebody that would have, you know, again, but it's usually compensatory in that case. So how do you make the decision of orientation versus compensation? I look at all my other measures. Okay. Okay. Does everything else fall into line or are there other things that are surprises? Right. So, so what I need to determine is I need to determine the actual shape and position of the entire upper thorax to determine what I'm looking at. Right. Do you have like a, for example, you know, going through like their infrasternal angles, this, their, this is this. And so trying to go, have an example where you go step by step to get to that decision? Um, like off the top of my head? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I, so, so what, do your, what do your appendicular measures provide for you in regards to the shape and position of the upper thorax? Mm -hmm. right? I, mean, I mean, you should know what those are in, in a relative uh, in a relative way, right? So there's there's a certain thing that's going to tell you where you are in 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 each plane, roughly, right? And so then you have an expectation of what that should be, and sometimes they don't match at all, right? You get you get those people that have a, a tremendous amount of laxity, and you don't really have a great measure to go to, right? Um, and and so those cases arise too. Um, the best way to determine whether you're correct or not is to intervene and then see what happens, right? Yeah. That's the best way. Do something that's safe, obviously, but do something and then recheck. And you say, oh, I wasn't right. Or you were when you get the, again, it, based on your intent, you had the desired result and you were correct. It's like, you know, we, we don't have to be absolutely right every time because most of the interventions that we perform are relatively safe. I mean, we don't hurt people. People don't experience, like we don't drive people into pain. We don't force things. And, and then you just measure and then intervene and remeasure. And that usually provides you the answer, whether you are correct or not. And then you make a note, like if it doesn't work out that way, you make a note and you say something, something's interesting about this, write it down. Right. And then you, you'll come back to it. But again, you should be able to, to, to get a relative determination of position based on the way that you measure. Right. Cause I think I know how you do it. I think so. I'm questioning myself now, but. Uh. Well, but, and that's good as you should. I mean, do you, I question myself every day, you know, you know, Brian was in the room in today and he saw a lot of really interesting stuff. And, and uh, I don't think I was 100% correct today, you know? I mean, there's one, one young lady that kind of threw me for a loop and it took me a minute to kind of figure out what the, heck, what the heck I was doing. And so I had to come up with a strategy that I haven't used in a really, really long time and, and literally passively put her where I wanted her to be because she couldn't do it actively without, without pain. Passively, she was 100% pain-free and then she could execute. 
And so now she's just got to work her way out of that position. So again, I don't, don't, don't worry about doubting yourself or questioning yourself. Keep people safe, intervene and remeasure. And then that's how you're going to learn. So, <laughs> working down to the elbow, how, uh -huh. how do you determine, you know, orientation compensation there? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've, you know, I've, I've tried looking at like radial ulnar deviation and I'm just like, I don't know. Maybe. Okay. All right. So, so let's make an assumption that we've got a, a, a fairly decent idea as to what the, the orientation of the shoulder is. Above, yeah. Okay. And so now we have only so many possibilities of what could be happening at, at the elbow relative to the humerus, right? I mean, I've got pronation and supination. Um, I can, I can hyperextend the elbow. I can have limitations in flexion, et cetera, et cetera. But, but let's, let's, let's use um, just pronation and supination to kind of make it simple because everything happens in the transverse plane anyway. Right. Um, so if under normal circumstances with all constraints intact, if I have a humerus that is, that is externally rotated, should I have more supination or should I have more pronation available to me? If the shoulders in ER, if the shoulders in external rotation, what should it look like? So when I measure supination and pronation, what would you expect to see in the forearm? I would expect to see less pronation because they've already pronated to get. Yeah. 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 But let me out let me throw you a curveball. So you got an externally oriented humerus and you got crazy, crazy, crazy pronation. What's your first thought? How did I get that? Some sort of compensation. Like it, it, so it's compensatory adaptation. Where, where would you expect that to be? What would be the limitation in pronation? Anything that supinates it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, so let me go from the elbow to the hip. Okay. Um, in your mind, I'm going to talk about a right hip. Okay. All right. Okay. So now I got a hip that has crazy internal rotation. All right. And limited external rotation. What muscle are you going to go after? An ad adductor. An adductor? Right. So I'm looking at a right hip. I've glute. got crazy internal rotation and limited external rotation. Oh, uh, glute. Okay. So what's the glute of the lateral elbow? What supinates the elbow? Supinator. Hey, there's an interesting thought now, isn't there? All right. Okay. So you see, it's just another hip. Okay. And so then you put them in an exercise that drives super, supinator function. What, what, position, what position would I want to orient the humerus in to make sure that I'm getting a reorientation of the elbow? If they're in ER, you'd want to put them in IR. Yep. Then supinate the arm yeah the forearm you know what you just did you just did an arnold schwarzenegger style um concentration curl so now we get to use curls to fix elbows how about that how how do you make decisions about targeting elbow flexors versus extensors well i mean what, what do i it, okay, what's my other supinator of the elbow? The bicep. Oh, interesting. Okay, and would that be an elbow flexor and an elbow extensor? Elbow flexor. Yeah, exactly. So if you if you're trying to drive strong supination, mm -hmm. but then I feel like, what would you be trying to achieve with like the supinated tricep extension? So um, do triceps pull in rotation at all? Um, I would say so. Yeah, they do, right? Yeah. Yep. So what would be, 
what would be a muscle that I would have concerns with in regards to elbow extension that's a lot like a supinator that influences the position of the ulna relative to the humerus. It's that little one that nobody cares about. Anconius. Anconius, yeah. So the anconius is a lot like the ad adductor, I think. Yeah, it's kind of like an adductor or an abductor. Adductor? Mm -hmm. Adductor. That's how I look. Yeah. You're doing that to try to change the relationship between the ulna and the humerus? Mm-hmm. Yes. So what would be, so you'll have to re say. So I put them in pronation and I extend the elbow. Put it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so I know in the previous example, we were talking about an externally rotated humerus and a pronated mm -hmm. forearm. Mm -hmm. Why would you, what would be the scenario where you select the pronated tricep extension? So it'd be the opposite of what you're looking at. So if I have like a, um, a elbow, like a, like a valgus position of the elbow, Oh. Right. So the, the medial aspect of the elbow is now lax. Right. So I would recruit the pronator. Right. And, and there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, that, that's a very gross simplification of what's going on. There's a lot of really cool stuff that goes on with like brachioradialis, triceps. Um, so, and don't forget, you got long head of triceps that's also attached to the scapula. So you're also influencing the position of the scapula, the humerus and the forearm all at the same time. So it's a, it's a pretty big bang type of a thing that, that we're talking about now, right? Because I have, I have a uh, um, sort of a retraction type force that the breaker radius creates on the, on the radius. Um, and then triceps contracts, creates a little bit of rotation through the humerus. Um, breaker radialis will create some rotation through the humerus. The long head of the triceps um, reorients the scapula. Uh, pronator teres um, uh, creates a higher pressure on the medial side of the elbow where the low pressure was. And so that reorients the position of the form relative to the humerus. So like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on. Cool. Yeah. Cool. But if you look at the, the way you, the, to, to, to try to, Again, look at this in a, in a uh, uh, reasonable way. If you look at the elbow in in sort of like uh, quadrants, so you have you have anterior lateral, uh, anterior medial, posterior lateral, posterior medial, and so if you look at those, um, and you look at okay, where is the high and low pressures, just like you would for a hip, then you can use the the recruitment pattern to Again, drive reorientation um, just by selecting the, the appropriate muscle activity. So in some cases, you'll have to externally rotate the humerus and then supinate the forearm. In some cases, you'll have to internally rotate the humerus and pronate the forearm. Again, you just have to uh, identify, um, again, just like you would for a hip, right? And then it, you but understand the elbow mechanics, like, okay, how much pronation and supination should I have relative to the humerus? And then your confirmation, which is really nice, is that you can use wrist motion. So you use wrist extension, flexion, and, and ulnar and radial deviation. Because when I pronate, um, when I pronate the forearm, the radius retracts a little bit. And so, so it makes the ulna seem relatively long. So I lose ulnar deviation. And so even though somebody doesn't look like they have a pronated forearm, but they lost ulnar deviation and extension, then I know that I'm, I've got a forearm that's resting in a pronated position. So you're saying if they, okay. I, I always assume they lost ulnar deviation because that was, that's just typically paired with pronation. But you're saying. Yeah, they, yeah, right. It is, it is. But what if it doesn't look like it's pronated, right? So now I need a confirmation of, of okay, where is this orientation, right? Because we can't eyeball stuff. We kind of have to rely on what our measures tell us. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm questioning the orientation at the elbow, my confirmation can very well be the wrist range. Now, there's also 
laxity that it could be occurring at the wrist that's going to throw me off. But again, I just got to look at the big picture and I got to, got to see where everything falls. And then I intervene and I just see, right? Because when there's ever a question, you, you make your best judgment, you intervene, and then you retest. Because mm -hmm. we're not going, the nice thing about physical therapy is that we don't use sharp objects and cut people open. So, so most of our interventions are, are reasonably safe, right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, gave me some new stuff to look at. <laughs> the elbow is really cool. The elbow is really cool. But again, if you, if you can, if you can make it seem like something else that's familiar, because I got news for you, every synovial joint works the same way. Right. The constraints are a little bit different, but, but they basically work the same way. Is that where you're going to be presenting on at the, uh, at your guys' uh, Midwest performance? I'm not presenting this year. You're not? No. no. I'm taking a year off. Yeah. i got stuff to do, man. Bummer. Hmm. Just wait. <laughs> Just wait. All right, I'll let someone else talk. I have a question for Steven. Can I, can I ask you a question? I, I don't know if that's allowed. <laughs> so I saw your video with the uh, syringe. Yeah, yeah. How'd you do? What'd you What'd you grade yourself there? Ah, uh, it was just a, a a thought that I had, and yeah. Um, it it seemed to match, you know, in regards to. I guess my thought was, you know, with a narrow infrasternal angle, the diaphragm, both diaphragms are descending. Mm -hmm. You know, distension of the typically see a distension of the abdominal contents and the uh, reduction in lordosis. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then I, I was looking at um, the, the thing I wasn't sure about is um, when the thoracic diaphragm is pulled away from the um, pelvic diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, both diaphragms descend or ascend, so the the kind of visceral piston moves up mm -hmm. um okay but i wasn't sure so let me help you can right, i help yeah. you a little bit yeah I was, I was hoping to comment on it that's why i put it up there <laughs> okay well i was saving it uh, for this okay so so here's here's where here's where it gets confusing based on what you did okay so you used the a singular syringe all right with a fixed volume and you tried to manipulate based on increasing and decreasing the pressure, okay? But, but there's differences between in, in, people with narrow infrastructural angles and wide infrastructural angles that are structural that you always have to consider, okay? So instead of one syringe, you need two, all right? You need a narrow infrastructural angle and you need a wide infrastructural angle because they're different, okay? Okay. All right? Now, I'm going to use something that's compressible to make a point so you understand, all right? I have air in there, all right? But I'm gonna show you something and, and hopefully you'll be able to see this. Um, so I'm gonna take the, the narrow one first, all right? So I'm going to compress this rather aggressively, okay? So I will, and, I'm, and so both of these syringes are gonna have 10 cc's of air to start and I'm gonna block it off and I'm gonna push down on it. And I can compress this down uh, based on my vision. I'm compressing it less than three millimeters, okay? Okay, so three cc's. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna take this one. This is wider, okay? But it's still 10 to start. And I'm gonna compress it and rather aggressively and I can only get about halfway down. So about five. Oh, I think it's okay. All right, so, so now we have to consider the differences between a narrow infrastructural angle and a wide infrastructural angle, okay? All right, so the difference is, is in shape, all right? So with a wide infrastructural angle, the surface area of the diaphragm that is compressing downward is bigger than the narrow, all right? And so what that means is for every nth degree of descent of the wide infrasternal angle, it produces a higher pressure. Yep. Okay. So for me to get an equivalent pressure with a narrow infrasternal angle, the diaphragm has to descend 
farther than it does with the wide. But here's the problem. Now I have constraints of the system. I can only descend the diaphragm so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the chances of me achieving the same intra-abdominal pressure with this as I do with this, one, it's either very, very difficult or it's not even possible. Okay. And then you also have to take into consideration that I have musculature that can change its orientation from concentric to eccentric, right? And so I'm gonna have an eccentrically oriented muscle strategy on this side and a concentrically oriented muscle strategy on this side. High pressure, low pressure. The, because the surface area of the stopper on the wider syringe, mm -hmm. is it wouldn't volume display, wouldn't the volume displacement still be the same? It just doesn't descend further. No. So, so, so if if this was if this was water, right, or something that's not compressible. If you look at if you look at hydraulics. So, um, assuming that that the pressures are are equivalent, right? This would have to descend farther than this one does, right? Because it's 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 area, which would be area of the plunger. Mm -hmm. So, so pressure equals force times the area of the plunger. So I need more force or more force on this side than this side, but this one has to descend farther to achieve the same level of pressure. Okay. So your narrows have a, a the, the diaphragm descends further when it's structural, right? They're, they tend to be narrower and more cylindrical than your wides do, which are narrow front to back and wide side to side. But the surface area of the diaphragm in a wide infrastructure angle is bigger, so it creates pressure faster. So, so it, it takes less descent to create the same amount of internal or intra-abdominal pressure. Okay. But that's a concentrically oriented strategy, which is why you see so much concentric muscle activity in your wides compared to your narrows. So your narrows tend to be these eccentric people, right? They rely uh, on uh, lower pressure strategies. And so then they're the ones that have more of the joint adaptations, right? So the connective tissues tend to be more lax because they, they rely on those for stability when they're not very good for stability because they're adaptive and they become looser. Because they can't generate as much abdominal pressure to, to... Right. So if I don't have an axial skeleton that can be stable enough, how can I have extremities that are stable enough? So if I don't use a concentric muscle strategy to stabilize, what do I have left? I have to use more connective tissue strategy to try to stabilize. Okay. That's my thinking. That's why I put it in the private group and not out. <laughs> well, but I'm and I'm willing to be wrong, but that's 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 my train of thought. Is is I'm just looking at this from from what are the physics? Yeah. What are yeah. the physics? And then then look at the biology of of adaptation. It's like okay, what do I have available? What is my what is going to be my strategy under the circumstance? I have a much bigger, broader descending diaphragm and the wide infrasternal angles. And that's why their strategies are different. And that's why our exercise selection tends to be different when, when, when we're trying to be more successful. That's why position of, of the body during exercise matters because I've got internal forces that are different in these two people, right? I mean, they have similarities and there's no question about that, right? But their strategy for movement is different. Therefore, my strategy for intervention is going to be different in many cases. And, and so you said the, the larger surface area of the plunger is what you, you said. Uh, yeah. If you look at if you look at hydraulics, it, it's 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 I want to I don't want to say it's simple physics because I'm I'm an idiot when it comes to physics. But but if you um, let me see here. So if I have if I have let's say. Um, I'm looking at my notes here because I, I was working on this the other day because it, it kind of just popped into my head that, that we've got a surface area problem is what we're looking at. So, so it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's it, for, uh, um, yeah, for, for, so again, pressure equals force, the for pressure equals force um, times the area. So if the area doubles, um, I can produce, um, more pressure with a with a shorter excursion 
because I've got more surface area applying the pressure. Okay. Would, would that be the same no matter like whether it's non-compressible or compressible fluid? Um, yeah, I, th I think the, the same rules would apply. But again, it's like, you, you know, when we're talking about humans, you've got like your constraints are manipulable, right? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can eccentrically orient things, I can expand things, but there's still constraints and there's still going to be a limitation. So the, the general principle of physics still applies, right? I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're abdom if your abdomen was fixed like the syringe is, it would be very easy to discern what the pressures are, right? Yeah. But, be, but because we're dealing with, with muscular constraints in, in a lot of this, um, it, it is manipulable. Cool. I, but, the, that, but the general premise should hold. Yeah, uh, that, that, that was helpful for sure. That, um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's 8.30, Lance. That was really cool. It's actually 5.30. <laughs> Huh? It's actually 5.30. Oh, in, in, in Lance time. <laughs> it it catches me off guard every time. <laughs> yeah. That was really cool. <laughs> what, what, what was cool? The uh, elaboration of something that maybe our, our good friend Stephen here helped oh. foster. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's really cool, too. I, I always like supporting an idea with a basic principle of physics. Mm -hmm. It seems to hold a little bit more. I'm sure you know it's it's a lot different having a, a rigid canister of a syringe versus mm -hmm. the abdominal wall, but still right. interesting. Well, but it, it it stands to reason that that what one um, we can't cheat physics, mm -hmm. right? But we do have adaptability that we have to take into consideration. But the rules don't change; the rules still apply. And that's helpful. Yeah. Right? I mean, thankfully they don't, because if they're constantly changing, we'd have no idea what to do. Cool. I think that's a, a great parting statement, uh, everybody. Thanks for coming. Stephen, thanks for getting put on trial <laughs> and not just closing out and leaving. Happy to help. <laughs> Uh, Tim, thanks for joining us as usual. And everybody, you can find this on the website, ifsuniversity.com. It's somewhere there. You'll have to search for it. Um, and this will be up soon. Bye.